again, uh, tonight we are really delighted to have our Digital Scholar Series uh, going strong. This is our second event and hopefully we're off to a good start. Um, I wanted to uh, start off just telling you a little bit about Jurist. Uh, Jurist uh, celebrating our uh, 25th anniversary this year and we've been around for a while and we've grown out of the University of Pittsburgh and we've now expanded into international and other domestic schools um, all around the world. Um, we have staff writing news and commentary all over and we're just delighted to have the digital scholars and everyone else on our staff uh, currently. Um, now this program is about uh, tech and access to justice and we're really excited for that and I wanted to first thank um, Alice Chen and Connor Hayland and Megan McKee and Zhao Li Jin for everything they did behind the scenes leading up to this event. And we're really grateful for all their work and uh, attention and making sure that things, everyone comes together as a community and has a good discourse. Um, I'd also like to welcome our panelists um, and I'll allow our two panelists to introduce themselves. Um, Eduardo, if you would like to start. Sure, hello, my name is Eduardo Gonzalez. I am the projects manager at the Self-Represented Litigation Network. Um, I primarily work uh, convening um, leaders in the access to justice space around civil justice projects and um, developing best practices and supporting collaboration. Um, my role as project manager is sort of evolving, but uh, in the mix of activities that we do over the summer, um, we were uh, holding bi-weekly calls uh, around problems facing the access to justice community. And so a lot of these tech and remote um, transitions really brought up a lot of problems that we were able to talk about and troubleshoot, but um, mostly we, we help people kind of solve their problems when they're in the front lines of this access to justice work. I'm happy to explore more about my background uh, in our conversation. Yeah, we are delighted to have you, Eduardo. Thank you so much. And we look forward to hearing more about your important work there at the uh, Self-Represented Litigation Network. We also have with us Dr. Hoffman. Uh, Dr. Hoffman is an assistant professor at the University of Washington. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself, Dr. Hoffman? Yeah, happy to. Uh, thanks for thanks for that. Yeah, I'm an assistant professor at the Information School at the University of Washington. Uh, prior to that, I was a postdoctoral uh, researcher instructor at the School of Information at UC Berkeley. Uh, and uh, I, in general, I, I think about data, uh, data science as a practice, uh, as an emerging profession. Uh, and uh, and the ethical values we often attach to that uh, things we think about like fairness, inclusion, uh, justice. There's the emerging discourse of data justice, uh, alongside sort of other emergent discourses around data colonialism, data feminism. I think about these things as these are these are my sites of inquiry. Uh, I'm particularly interested in my work in looking at and understanding how people are talking about and deploying concepts like fairness, like inclusion, like justice, when they're talking about sort of ethical issues relevant to data technologies broadly, whether that is in the domain of discriminatory algorithms, whether that's in the domain of, uh, of, of AI and, uh, and, and advanced sort of machine learning practices. Uh, I'm really interested in how people converge on and talk about uh, ethical issues and what, what views, perspectives, or, or sort of um, ways of knowing that those discourses exclude. Um, so I, 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 I often think about ethics in much in the same way. There's kind of a, a famous quote, and I'm blanking on the scholar's name right now about technology, that technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. And uh, I, feel, I often feel the same way about our ethics. Um, it, it, we kind of have a universally, you know, we, we tend to uh, associate ethics with a kind of universal good that you're doing, you're doing something ethical. We aspire to be ethical. Uh, it kind of has a universally positive connotation in many ways, uh, but our ethics are also not neutral. Uh, they also foreground certain voices, certain perspectives, and certain ways of knowing, and, and I'm really interested in that. And I'm happy to talk about my background, how I ended up uh, doing what I do, where I do it, uh, and, and how I see it bearing on the uh, sort of broader conversation. 
I am certainly very excited to hear uh, what our two panelists have to say. Thank you, Dr. Anna and uh, Eduardo. Um, our moderators are gonna be taking it over here shortly. Um, we have approximately 40 minutes of our moderated questions. Um, they have several questions and hopefully you'll get a chance to get into your backgrounds that you uh, so wonderfully alluded to. And uh, our moderators are gonna be Imad Rizvi. Um, he, he is a jur Juris Digital Scholar at Yale studying computer science and economics. And our other moderator is gonna be Samantha Thorne, uh, a Juris Digital Scholar and incoming Harvard Law student. And I'll let our uh, moderators introduce themselves and take it over. Um, thank you and thanks for hosting, Michael, and thanks for joining us, everyone, and especially our speakers today. Um, like Michael mentioned, um, I'm Samantha. I'll be starting up at Harvard Law this um, fall remotely, but you know, no complaints. Um, and um, so I guess, um, Ahmad, I'll, I'll start with the first question, then would you like to introduce yourself when you go to ask your next question? Yeah, Perfect. sounds good. Great, okay, so we know there are myriad areas within law and technology that one can explore and specialize in. Um, what initially drew you to the topic of data and technology and how can it help or hurt access to justice? Um, Eduardo, why don't you start first? Sure, um, I think the, you know, my biggest bite at data and tech initially came out of my, um, fellowship project at uh, Georgetown. Georgetown partnered with the Suffer Presented Litigation Network and um, I worked on several projects in the two years I was a fellow. Uh, my first project uh, involved conducting a nationwide survey of um, access to justice infrastructures and so this was a lot of like high level policy statewide stuff about how um, these access to justice initiatives and, and projects were being deployed. Uh, and then we also conducted a county by county survey to see what sort of self-help services existed. Um, and that was just an extremely difficult task. Um, so it was like this big data problem, right? Nobody was reporting in the same way. There was no uniformity in what was actually being tracked, uh, depending on where, um, you know, a, a court was situated. It, it depended, you know, what data they were actually collecting, if they were collecting data at all. And so it was really hard to get this really average you know, U United States baseline for access to justice. Um, and that's a, sort of, is a big problem that I think we're still trying to deal with in the access to justice civil space. Um, courts are starting to deal with this as they integrate more technology. And so for me, it's something I, I think I want to be a part of, but it's definitely not like a one organization is going to solve this problem because it's a, it's a big like, you know, industry issue. Um, so it's very big. I think it, it can help to move in that direction and to create better interoperability between all this tech and data um, pieces. But, you know, that's only going to happen and, and we're going to maximize what we, we can get from technology if we're able to, you know, prepare that infrastructure piece and, and invest in that. And I, I don't think that's happening right now, at, at least not with all these, you know, rapid responses to move to, to remote. And so I'm, I'm sure the, you know, Doctor has a lot more to say about uh, those big challenges. Thank you, and Dr. Hoffman, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, my my story getting to these topics is it's not it's not separable from my sort of uh, from my sort of life experience. And uh, for me, I'm a I'm a first generation college grad. Uh, I grew up in rural Minnesota, about 30 miles from where a little house on the prairie was set, and a very a very particular uh, sort of place in the world. And um, and I you know when I graduated from my undergrad, I studied media. I did work in media studies and English and. Uh, kicked around doing, you know, the the kinds of um, the kinds of jobs that were available to me at the time as a as a first generation college grad. I didn't really know what I was was I was getting into, and um, and I eventually went back to grad school after uh, after kind of an, uh, we'll say I call my uh, or my mid twenties my like years of zero gravity, and then I uh, I eventually went back to grad school, and I thought I was going to be a librarian. Uh, this is actually where my 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 
original sort of interest in this stuff came. I thought, well, I like books. I, I need something to do. I'll go and get a master's. This was at the this was uh, at the time of the the last recession. Uh, so this was 2008. Um, and so, like a lot of people, you go and hide out in grad school when you're faced with a <laughs> with a recession. And um, and when I showed up to orientation, I was sitting there and there was a professor talking uh, down, uh, down the row from me in the auditorium. And she was talking about, uh, at the time, the ethics of doing research on people's MySpace profiles without them knowing. Uh, and so this dates me, this is 2007, 2008. I was very much uh, a MySpace user at the time. And I was like, whoa, what? Researchers doing what? And I ended up getting in a conversation with this professor uh, and ended up getting a job in her lab and decided that I didn't want to do this library thing. I was like, I was in all in on this ethics of new technology stuff. I was like really, really interested. And that's where I eventually sort of, uh, my interest sort of developed into thinking about how, uh, how we talked about different ways uh, of engagement online, how we talked about different sort of possibilities uh, for justice online. I eventually uh, stayed stayed there. Uh, this is at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. I stayed through, did my PhD there, PhD there working with Dr. Michael Zimmer, who's now at Marquette, um, who's a research ethicist. And uh, I got really interested at the time in Google Books and what was happening with the Google Books lawsuit. And uh, this was, this is something we, we barely think about anymore, I, I feel like, but it really marked the end of the aughts, the, the early 2010s. Uh, there was, you know, there was a big uh, legal battle over, over what was going to happen with Google Books. Was it fair use? Was it not? Um, and the, the ramifications that was going to have for uh, content circulation on the web generally. Uh, and I was in particular interested in a claim that, that Eric Schmidt, then Google CEO, had made in, a, in an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. And he said, uh, he said that Google Books brought about a heightened egalitarianism of information. And I thought that was fascinating um, because, you know, I hear this word egalitarianism, as I'm sure many of you do, and you think about these, these sort of broad, uh, noble, oftentimes democratic, liberal norms that we, we aspire to, to sort of realize and uphold. And I, I found myself wondering, well, how come, how does seeing a snippet of a picture of a book at a library, like helping me realize a heightened egalitarianism of information. And uh, what I ended up doing was sort of looking at uh, a number of different approaches and theories of justice. I, I myself am a reformed, uh, a once Rawlsian, uh, uh, less so today, uh, but at the time was very sort of enamored with, with that particular strain of, of thinking about justice and, you know, realize that if you took a very basic resources conception, instrumental conception of, of technology, and, and if you only counted justice as whether, like, in terms of bits and bytes, can I technically see more information because Google book is, Books exists? Yes. I can. I can see a snippet of a book at a library at the Bodle Bodleian Library at Oxford that me as a first generation college student in Minnesota wouldn't wouldn't have been able to see. Right. Like technically on a very limited conception of justice, I would. I, yes, it, it, it is improving access. Uh, but then I was uh, also at the same time struck by uh, by critiques coming from um, disability, critical disability studies scholars, uh, critiques coming from feminist scholars. Uh, and critiques from, from critical race scholars uh, around the more uh, sort of environmental, ecological, and the sort of the, the broader tale of things that have to happen in order for you to get in front of a computer screen and be able to access this thing. Uh, and, and that was really sort of what sent me on my journey. And then I ended up, um, it was in this dissertation in the early aughts where I, I had some early thoughts about algorithmic discrimination um, because you took, the, the, you took these, this resource, you took entire library collections that you that were accessible via various kind kinds of means and you reduce them to a little white search box that you are then sort of subject to a singular company's uh, articulation of what information access what what search should look like and uh, so I started to think about well what are what are the what are the sort of problematics of turning entire library collections over to a single private company that then dictates 
your access to that information via a very particular, very minimalistic, um, often opaque mechanism. And that was sort of my first foray into thinking about uh, discriminatory algorithms and algorithms of power and control, uh, which I then eventually sort of went on and fleshed out um, during my time at Berkeley. And now, uh, and now I work a lot on uh, this concept that I call data violence, which is thinking about uh, the way that certain reductive uh, views of the world, uh, reductive views of identity, uh, the kind of the, the way we all have to reduce ourselves to particular checkboxes in order to gain access to sites and services, uh, and, and uh, how then that data might be collected and used to inform services, used to uh, target advertising, used to uh, curate your news feeds, uh, how that might sort of create feedback loops into our identities uh, and and how it might uh, regurgitate sort of violent discursive and symbolic norms uh, as we've seen in the work of others like Sophia Noble and her book Algorithms of Oppression uh, where she has done uh, extensive work showing how Google search results for terms like black girls would would turn up uh, reams of pornography, right? And so what does that, what does that say about our sort of societal view of a particular group of people or class of people if you go to one of the world's preeminent information resources, type in that query, and that's the kind of information you're getting back. Um, so I've been thinking much, much more broadly about these, these circuits of symbolic violence that these systems can, um, can, uh, can sort of perpetuate. Uh, thank you both for, for those thoughtful answers. Um, and before I get into the next question, uh, I just wanted to briefly introduce myself. My name is Ahmad. Uh, I'm a junior at Yale and I'm part of the Digital Scholars Program at Jurist. And I also wanted to announce that for anyone else who has questions that they'd like to ask the panelists throughout the course of the uh, next 40 minutes, you can type it in the chat and at the end we'll have 10 or 15 minutes available uh, to read out your questions as well. Um, so the next question I wanted to ask are, what are some of the biggest opportunities for tech to improve justice uh, or access to justice? And are there any exciting developments or specific projects that you've been involved with or seen over the past few years that you'd like to share? Um, and maybe Dr. Hoffman, would you like to go first? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I always struggle with this question. Uh, in part, I was uh, uh, last year. I had the opportunity to present alongside uh, Dr. Ruha Benjamin, who's at Princeton, and she wrote a book recently called "Race After Technology" that I highly recommend. Um, uh, and she was asked a, a similar question she, at the at the end of the the event uh, during a Q and A. And I I, I, I cite this because I was really moved by her answer. And she she said, you know, I'm not here to do PR for other people. And and so I, I often feel that way when I when I when I'm thinking about. Um, uh, when I'm thinking about responses to the like what's what's working what's going well question, um, but uh, I would also draw attention back to uh, to Ruha's work, and she has a really sort of powerful discussion at the in the conclusion of that book um, that that I often sort of direct folks to when they're asking this question, and she uh, she presents sort of a, a picture of two different applications. Uh, one of them is uh, is an uh, unfortunately now defunct app as a result of COVID. 19 and the uh, the sort of the economic downturn, uh, which was uh, Appalition, uh, which was an which was an app that was uh, it was a it was a fintech app, a financial tech app, where uh, you you downloaded it, it would um, it would plug into your bank accounts, and it was it would round certain transactions and take your spare change and route it to bail funds globally. Uh, or globally in the United States, uh, and and then that money would be used to post bail for for uh, for people who were unable to afford it under sort of unjust and exploitative um, bail, bail regimes. And then she compares this to uh, I, I, the Promise app, which is uh, venture capital backed, supported by the likes of Jay Z and others. And she points out that uh, that that this app um, it's a it, it's meant it's pitched as a decarceration app that you know, instead of putting youth in particular in jail, they would download this app on their phone and it would allow caseworkers and others to track their whereabouts. And she presents these two apps and I, and I find this, this conversation really persuasive as, uh, as a really critical lens through which to view uh, how technology organizes power. And she points out that, uh, that, that this Promise app, uh, it is, it, 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 though it has a ton of support, it's very high profile, it essentially just ends up extending the carceral 
logic outside of the prison. Uh, you can compare this to things like ankle monitors, right? Um, so instead of the prison being a, an actual building, uh, the prison now becomes a sort of information network. And, and, and so she, she uh, points people to, to, she directs people to think about uh, how technology intervenes with, extends, or challenges power. And in this case, she points out it's not really challenging sort of existing power structures. It's just giving, it's just sort of technologically extending existing carceral logics. Um, as opposed to an app like Appalition, where the money is being targeted in very specific ways. Um, it's, it's not going into, it's not, it's not you know, sort of uh, going to police departments. It's not going to local law enforcement. It's, it's, it's posting bail. Uh, and, um, and when I think about the projects that are doing well, they are these projects where the technology almost at times seems incidental to the overall mission. Um, and, and just like Appalachian is just a way of leveraging uh, a particular network financial infrastructure in order to achieve this broad social and political goal uh, of, of abolition. Uh, I, I, I think that that's, that's an, that to me is an example of a good project, right? Of a project that is increasing access to justice, um, not because it, it's sort of instrumental to justice, um, but it is just merely bolstering a broader uh, sort of social and political agenda uh, that, that we might see as sort of progressive or just, uh, as opposed to the Promise app that, that is just merely extending uh, sort of existing problematic power relationships. Great, I, I can pick up from there. Um, and those comments, I think, um, I think on the on the broad access to justice, like uh, like big, big scale, are is very are super important. I think from my perspective, um, I come in uh, when I think about access to justice. Um, at least the work that I've been doing and uh, the members that we've engaged uh, at SRLN and through the project work that I've engaged in um, is primarily focused on the ability of somebody to access, um, you know, judicial outcomes that are fair and just uh, in the civil justice space, right? Because in the criminal justice space, it's like a, a whole different system, although many of the same, I, I think, opportunities for tech exist. Um, and I think on on the civil justice space, right, accessing courts and accessing um, these sort of court outcomes, um, the biggest opportunity for technology, honestly, is the consumer framework that technology brings, right? In um, the labs, you know, the, the consumer labs that technology has been developed, there's a lot of user testing, user feedback, refining the interfaces that the consumer has with their, their devices. Um, you know, especially for their healthcare now, right? They, uh, these interfaces are improving so much that the expectation of fairness is going to be that you have easy access to information and records that you need. And unfortunately, I think in the, the civil justice space or in the court systems, it's not uh, the technology, you know, perspective is not sophisticated enough to have already embodied a lot of that practice of getting user testing you know, created to improve a technology service. Um, and I think this is true of perhaps the legal practice, right? And another highly professionalized industries is that technology has been more a tool to create a product um, and it has not been seen itself as the interface that somebody's actually receiving a service. Uh, and so that, that expertise and that capacity isn't something that, you know, courts are able to hire or legal aid is able to hire and so that is coming from, you know, the broader ecosystem. And so better partnerships with community partners to have triage and referral are sometimes some of the best ways to get user testing or to get feedback or to, just to get information in people's hands. And um, the, the technology opportunity is that like that entire ecosystem of testing technology and getting feedback and improving it and building it and maintaining it is something that can really improve the way um, to justice is iterated, right? And so we look at process simplification and plain language. Um, and those are all mechanisms that I think comes with the idea that we innovate through technology. And so uh, to the point of, of thinking about implicit bias and how that is being used um, to kind of stifle a person's ability to actually obtain a fair outcome uh, I think those conversations need to, need to also be embedded um, in the justice area, right? I think integrating the conversation of broader technology access and, and removing 
um, removing algorithmic bias um, is a big part of where this court technology access to justice uh, needs to push in, right? And that it can't be a separate market, I think. Um, justice is becoming way more con consumer centered and customer service oriented. Uh, and that is, I think, the best way that uh, technology can be really deployed. And um, there's like, there are tons of, of projects, really great and interesting projects right now going on that like, I would, I, I don't want to miss anything. And so uh, I, I'll recommend a couple of, you know, networks and people that you can talk to some podcasts and um, the information streams that I'm sort of consuming. It's, you know, the, the people in the justice tech space are, are very open to connecting and they're very active on social media. And so, you know, they, they really are very accessible. And so it shouldn't be hard to, to service some really great um, projects online. Great, thank you. And um, you mentioned kind of algorithmic biases and talked about the technology it's, itself. And our next question was kind of building off that. Um, and since technology itself can be discriminatory and exclusive, what are some of the biggest challenges of using technology to improve justice or access to justice? Um, and then Eduardo, if you wanna start with this one. Yeah, yeah, and I think the, the, the way that I've thought about it, and I don't know where, where it came from, it's probably somewhere online, but um, you know, it's the idea that technology cannot fix a problem that technology did not create. And so if you have process problems, if you have you know, documents and forms that you can't really read, if you just, put a technology interface over it, it's not really going to fix a lot, right? And so if, if laws and if rules and if process is already unduly burdensome on marginalized people, low income, low resource people um, who already have problems accessing justice, if you just put a technology layer over it, you're going to just embody some of that, right? And then you're going to have to go back and assess. And so it, it just takes a lot of constant feedback from the people that you're designing these solutions for. Um, there's a book that I really like. Um, it's called Innovating. It's by Luis Perez Brava. Um, Brava and, and, you know, the, the whole concept of innovating is learning more about the problem um, and you iterate a solution. And so the solution can be very different. So, you know, you can go in there with an idea of using tech, um, but the more you learn about the impact and the changes that it's causing, maybe the solution is getting rid of a really silly process that, you know, is kind of an artifact of how we, we actually interact now. And so that's more of the solution than the technology itself, right? And that, that's a framework I would take to a lot of these opportunities and challenges is that technology isn't going to be the end all solution if you don't really invest on um, getting the infrastructure ready for automation. Um, and that requires a lot of awareness of your you know, demographic constituents or, or the people that you serve. I, I just want to piggyback on what Eduardo was saying and, and, um, and say yes. And, uh, and, and also note that this question of what role does technology play in solving social, political, or other problems, um, there's, a, there's, an, there's an added risk on top of what uh, Eduardo has already eloquently identified as this, as this you know, introducing technology to fix a problem that is not fundamentally sort of introduced by the technology. Um, that can also become a space of, of sort of opportunism and exploitation uh, on the part of technology purveyors. And, and there's actually a very, and there's a, you know, there's a really long history in uh, sort of philosophy of technology in thinking about how, um, how we, uh, how particular uh, actors or institutions are interested in, in actually actively converting social, translating social problems into technical ones so that then they can provide the solution for them. Um, I, I, I'm always enamored by the, the, the sort of late uh, French, uh, French theorist uh, Jacques Ellul, who was who is doomsday and way too deterministic, uh, but he has a he has a, a, a quote uh, that technology is the source of its own ethics. And and I, I, what he's speaking to there is this this idea that we we reshape our, our our views of the world, our views of process, our views of institution in order to fit the technology rather than vice versa. And that it's the pull that technology has that we conform our ethics to the tools that are available to us as opposed to revising the tools. Um, and and I think this is particularly true in the in the sort of emerging domains of uh, sort of 
fairness research, especially at the technical level, uh, and, and questions of algorithmic bias. This is something I've done work on. Um, I have a paper uh, called Where Fairness Fails, uh, uh, Data Algorithms and the Limits of uh, Anti-Discrimination Discourse. And actually, this is a place where I think legal scholars uh, have, have a long history of, uh, of writing and research uh, to draw on to contribute in this space, because I ended up in that paper drawing a lot on early critical, what we would now call critical race theory. Uh, but a lot of that early formative critical race theoretic work was, was law scholarship. We're talking like Kimberly Crenshaw's formative work, Alan David Freeman's formative work in the late 1970s. And this, this was work that was showing all of the ways that the sort of, that the, the reduction of justice, especially in the wake of civil rights legislation of the late 1960s, uh, the reduction of justice to particular, uh, to particular kinds of calculus, uh, calculi, calculuses, uh, into particular kinds of calculi that the courts would then deploy to determine whether or not somebody was eligible for, uh, you know, for a positive ruling in a discrimination suit. Uh, that was often reducing these things to a formula that put an onerous burden, uh, first of all, on the on the victim of discrimination uh, to, to, to show uh, that discrimination had occurred, that it, it was often placing beyond the reach of the law. Uh, this was Alan David Freeman's point, that it was often placing beyond the reach of the law uh, sort of uh, environmental or other considerations. What it wanted was really mechanistic causal reasoning. You, you were discriminated against, tell me the person, the place, and the time, and the concrete outcome that was discriminatory and and that's what we'll give you it doesn't matter if removing one bad person from that environment leaves a toxic toxic racist workplace largely intact that was that was sort of beside the point for courts and i think we see this being repeated in a lot of the sort of uh, algorithmic fairness conversations where we're often instead of looking for the bad actor in an institution we want the bad data or we want the bad algorithm like tell me tell me which variable i weighted wrong in this system and we'll tweak the code tell me which you know population was undersampled in the training data and we'll get a more diverse data set and that'll fix the problem Right, as if sort of, as if sort of making a let's say a recidivism prediction tool uh, that's determining uh, whether or not somebody gets parole, uh, as as if you know just adjusting the data, the training data, or the algorithm is going to fix the fact that this broader system is rigged in particular ways, right? Uh, and so, so I think there's a lot here that, that legal scholars in particular can contribute in thinking about some of these longer critiques of technocratic and other bureaucratic processes that have thwarted and undermined justice and how we're reinventing them. We're just replacing data and algorithms for the bad actors in, in institutional settings. Uh, um, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Great. Well, thank you both for um, your insights on the pre on our questions that we've had thus far. Um, we're going to kind of shift to talking about COVID-19 as it is a very prevalent issue. And so our next question is, have you seen COVID-19 affect access to justice, um, whether through court closures or increased use of virtual platforms? And from your perspective, um, what is the role of technology in ameliorating this issue? Um, Dr. Hoffman, why don't you start off? Uh, well, I, in this case, I would absolutely have to defer to Eduardo because I, I think Eduardo is doing the the kind of work that that this is going to show up much more uh, sort of in the immediate day to day. Uh, I think some of this thinking hasn't quite filtered down into sort of uh, academic spaces yet. Um, uh, you know, I know that there are people gathering data and asking questions. There have been some preliminary, and there's been some preliminary research on you know Zoom dynamics in sort of Supreme Court. Uh, arguments and things, uh, but uh, I think Eduardo uh, is probably uh, has some more frontline uh, information to offer. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's, yes, right, like a huge yes. I think everybody can can really take two seconds to really think about the how court closures, um, uh, you can see in, in some cities, closures have extended because of, you know, the there's actual um, writing and potential violence closures for courts because courts are at the center of, of a lot of the um, social angst that, that people are feeling right now. So um, yeah, how, how and, and to what impact I think um, is really um, depends on where you're, where you're talking about, right? And this goes back to my point that, um, 
you know, the, the ability to measure or access to justice really depends on what you're talking about because every community has their own, you know, system of community organizations, advocacy groups, legal aid, bar associations, and courts, and, and everybody's kind of working in different and similar angles to improve and respond. And so some of the biggest um, changes, right, is obviously moving everything remote or, or digitizing services um, for, a, a, I think, I don't want to kind of provide an exhaustive list of everything that's happening right. I think if you really want to, you can go to the ABA's, um, you know, COVID response page and they'll, you know, give you a big view of all the organizations that have been involved in providing resources for um, courts struggling uh, to move their operations remotely. Um, I think on the topic of our discussion, uh, some of the biggest things, right, is moving to virtual hearings. And I think the um, my commentary goes with like the, the, the informative piece of what's going on, right? I think my critique is that a lot of the things that even before COVID were working in some states like Alaska, um, which has had call hearings, right? Where you can call into your hearing um, because Alaska's infrastructure really lends itself to needing remote access, right? Um, they've had this system that has worked really well, right? right now with video conferencing and hearings right we're dealing with the digital divide problem the digital gap people need devices and they need service to access the online hearings right so cellular service might run out it's expensive you're not in a place where you have the infrastructure for it okay then you need the device to actually access if it's going to be a video hearing where you have to be physically in front of there then you need a quiet place uh, you need a good microphone, probably, and you need to be in a place that you maintain some dignity, right? And so some people do not have the best situations. They don't have a plant that they're really proud of growing over all of this COVID thing like I do. So it's like, those are all these considerations that you have to take when you're going to go to video conferencing because that's what everybody was doing in Zoom, right? So these rapid responses didn't lend themselves to really asking, what do we need? what feedback are we getting? And so none of those feedback channels and loops existed before COVID because uh, by and large courts don't have the capacity to actually get feedback to improve operations and simplify because there's just way too much to do. Um, and so this problem was exacerbated when you're moving now every operation to remote. So you have you know, your frontline staff that's actually providing the services that are kind of dealing with the trauma at home on their own their family's coming back, maybe they have children, maybe they're you know, immunocompromised, whatever, right? There's a huge issues that they're dealing with. And then they're also responsible for putting up remote operations, which is also a whole different challenge without guides, without templates. So there's like, you know, the response um, that SRLN was ever able to put up was trying to facilitate knowledge sharing, getting these guides out and, and kind of creating some sort of um, knowledge sharing environment. And I think those sorts of resilient responses are really um, powerful. And I hope that that's kind of what a good takeaway of all these COVID responses is, is that you need to cultivate and, and build these community relationships so that entire communities could respond to a crisis, right? I think uh, disaster networks in Florida um, are very good models for that, where people are cross-trained to, to just be able to manage um, triaging for public services. I think the courts and, and local justice systems can do that. And this, whatever courts have done at post COVID, right? There's a whole question of what is going to um, be transitioned to, to full, you know, a full permanent thing. What's gonna revert back? How are you gonna inform the public? There are a lot of, you know, challenges that are just gonna keep coming up. But uh, I think the best way to handle and deal with them, uh, whether they're tech based or not, is going to be by opening channels of feedback and, and really getting the public to tell you what their problems are and responding to them um, and adjusting your solutions that way. I think technology was adopted very, very quickly. It was effective for a lot of people, but it, in, in it captured all of these you know, challenges that, that the doctor has mentioned. And, and that's just even worse now because people are dealing with high levels of inability to pay uh, way more challenging things than worrying about getting a video phone to get to a hearing because you're probably not going to pay rent anyway. Um, and so you're probably going to get evicted whether or not you have a, a hearing, right? So I think there are way bigger challenges that people are dealing with. Um, and so it just phone calls would be enough, I think, in a lot of places for a lot of these hearings. Like we don't need video 
for a lot. Yeah, thank you guys. And um, the last question we wanted to ask before we open it up to some of the questions that were submitted is, um, you guys have mentioned race after technology innovating and kind of building off that. What are some of the books, resources, or websites you'd recommend to people who are interested in learning more about tech, access to justice, um, more about your work, or just how they can be more involved with these issues? Uh, we can start with Eduardo. Sure. Um, so the networks that I follow are you know, SRLN um, is a network that has um, a huge array of constituencies that, that share problems and resources. And so we have listservs and then we have working groups that you can join. Um, that is a huge source of, of information. People post their challenges on there a lot. Um, LSN tap also, and, and I can share these um, to be emailed out to attendees, but uh, they also have a, a really great and uh, enriching listserv that I also follow. Uh, the National Center for State Courts over COVID has put up these tiny chats and webinars. Um, the NLADA has also put up a lot of, you know, information. And so uh, the ABA's website has a lot of this aggregated together. And so their resource page really does a lot of bringing together all of the streams that I would recommend following if you're interested in all of these access to justice um, initiatives. On the tech side, I think that's Follow the hashtags legal tech, access to justice, tech, any of that. I think you'll quickly see who, who the re recurring commenters are and they have podcasts and they have um, a lot of great information streams that I think um, are really easy to access and they're all really friendly people. So um, I think, you know, get yourself on, on that social media level. Um, I think that's where a lot of the legal tech folks are connecting. Thank you, uh, and Dr. Hoffman. Yeah, so uh, a couple of a couple of things. Um, I again, I, I, I can't recommend Ruha Benjamin's Race After Technology enough. Um, it is it is a it is a, it's oriented towards a broader audience, so it's not you know it's not specifically towards people who work in sociology or black studies where she's located at Princeton. So it's written for a broader audience, but it is, it, it doesn't sacrifice uh, sort of depth and insight at the same time. Uh, and so I, I highly recommend that. Um, there is a, there's a, if folks are podcast people, there's a, a new-ish podcast called Radical AI uh, that is really kind of a data justice podcast in general, um, the, despite the name. And they, they talk to, they've talked to a number of people uh, that anyone that they've interviewed, I would say, is, is you know, um, is, is somebody worth listening to, um, uh, including the, there's an episode on, um, on COVID uh, tracing, uh, contact tracing apps and privacy concerns with Seda Gersis, who works out of, um, out of the Netherlands, who is one of my personal sort of uh, academic heroes. Um, and so I would, I would highly recommend that. Um, and then uh, there is, there's some more recent work that's a little more popular oriented that I think it, that I think translates well across domains. Um, there is, the, there's the, there's a book called Data Feminism that is essentially a, it's sort of a data visualization and justice popular text uh, by Lauren Klein and Catherine Vignazio uh, that, uh, that I think is quite accessible. Um, there is uh, Design Justice by Sasha Cassandra Chalk, who's an MIT researcher who's really interested and involved in a number of um, uh, sort of grassroots technology design initiatives. Uh, and so uh, she, uh, she helps maintain the Design Justice Network. Um, and, uh, and then there's a project out of uh, Michigan that I really like that I think is worth following called Our Data Bodies. Uh, and this is a project oriented towards sort of working with, uh, with affected communities in terms of uh, issues of data sovereignty and data ownership and uh, what it means to sort of build technology and data infrastructures to advocate for uh, for communities to advocate for themselves in various contexts. So the Our Data Bodies project, uh, I, also, uh, I also highly recommend. Oh, and uh, Virginia Eubanks, Automating Inequality. If you wanna know how these things uh, intersect with social, especially the provision of social services, um, Virginia Eubanks' book is, is excellent and also oriented towards a broad audience. Uh, she, she has a great line uh, about how, you know, if technology is not 
is not specifically designed to confront power, it will uh, it will exacerbate it will only amplify it. Um, and so, uh, so I think she does a really good job of of painting the stakes. Uh, uh, what's at stake when we treat technology as merely instrumental or merely neutral in a given situation. And thank you for these recommendations. I have a long reading list and listening list ahead of me, but thank you for that. Um, so I guess we're going to open up to our questions. Um, so one that was submitted on our event registration form um, for Michael said, or Wait, it was not from Michael. That's from a different one. Sorry. Um, so I guess we'll start off with what things should attorneys be mindful of when interacting with clients who have different levels of tech knowledge? Um, how can we integrate a client's tech aptitude into the intake and advice process? I would, yeah, my, my flag is always going to be um, staked on just ask. And so you can ask, hey, what, is, what are you most comfortable with? Um, if you need to for security purposes or for actually sharing or, you know, communicating with your client in a way that you want to, then you really need to train up your client, make sure that they're aware of their, you know, needs. I think that's by and large some commentary that is, you know, if it's not already in there, it might already be on the, the APA's regulation around competency around tech. Um, and it's like, I think critical for um, attorneys to really understand that, uh, especially as we are you know, entering environments where there are a lot of platforms where you're gonna plug in your information to. Uh, and I think that's you know, something that attorneys just need to be aware of. And, and it's a, a part of it, I think, is doing whatever CLE classes and treating it seriously. I, I don't think there's a way around it, right? You can't, there's no easy button, easy button to getting through with tech. Like you, you need very good data hygiene and you need good device hygiene for um, you and also all your clients work. And that involves training your client on what they might need to do to make sure that their information is secure and confidential. I'll pass on this one. Okay. Um, next question uh, from Michael. How should law schools be adapting their curricula to ensure that future lawyers have a basic aptitude for recognizing uh, access to justice issues and discrimination related to technology? Um, and what skills are necessary to become an informed justice or tech advocate? We can start with Dr. Hoffman. If uh, that's it. yeah, yeah. I'm I'm pondering. I'm pondering what my my response here is. I am the I am the outsider, uh, right? I did not do. I did not go to. I did not go to law school. Um, I uh, I'm a sort of um, inveterate humanist from from, from a distance. Uh, and uh, I think one I was once described as the the human version of an Atlantic article about why computer science needs the humanities. So that's really like the perspective that, uh, that, that I'm bringing. Um, but I think, you know, there, one of the things I would encourage folks to avoid, there, there, there are a couple of things in this space. One is like be very, uh, be incredibly cognizant of the, of uh, your own access to knowledge being captured by dominant players in this space. We are currently witnessing, uh, you know, we're, we're, just yesterday we had here antitrust hearings with uh, Zoom talking head CEOs, including Jeff Bezos first, you know, appearance before, uh, before, before Congress on these issues. And, um, and one of the things that I think uh, academia in general is, is struggling with, uh, research universities in particular, and this, kind of, this includes law schools, is that there is a lot of, uh, there's, there's a, a lot of money and a lot of promise uh, uh, of access uh, on, on, on the part of, of these companies, often in ways that are not always immediately apparent to, to students that are, aren't, aren't even always immediately apparent to researchers. Um, so that's just something, uh, don't, uh, just be mindful of the ways that your own knowledge uh, might be sort of uh, captured by those interests. Uh, um, and uh, to, to that note, I also think that there is oftentimes a tendency in certain 
in certain places, and this is not specific to law schools, but it's not as it doesn't, doesn't accept law, uh, law scholars, legal scholars either, um, is there's a kind of privileging of, of technical knowledge that like, you, unless you really like know how the algorithm works, you don't really have a, a standing to speak on. Uh, you don't have a, le a leg to stand on. Uh, and there are some instances where that might be true, certain kinds of arguments you might be trying to make that, that might be true. Um, but I, I also encourage you to resist that sort of reproduction of technical knowledge as as ultimately somehow more true or or, or more real or more powerful. Um, and and you can learn a lot. You can learn a lot from the the voices of, of people who are impacted by technology uh, uh, as well. You know whether it's folk theories about how algorithms work, whether it's uh, it's real life experiences. Um, and I think it's important to. Uh, to sort of bring that social and contextual knowledge to bear uh, and, and not sort of overprivilege the, the point of view of computer scientists or, um, or, or you know, programmers or people working inside uh, these companies that are providing tools. Um, I, I think the, my answer to this question, I think, is modeled over uh, around the kinds of programs that I've, I've seen and, and the projects that I've seen at law schools. Um, when I was at Georgetown, I worked with Professor uh, Tanina Rostein on the Iron Tech Lawyer competition. Um, and so her program puts together a bunch of you know, law students who take the class into different groups of four to five law students. They, they each have a legal aid organization that they're working on a tech project with. They work with them throughout the entire um, semester doing you know, training on user design using the Neodologic um, platform to create these legal tools and then they compete at the end of the year. Um, this last, th this year, um, as part of like kind of ending my fellowship, um, I helped them create an invitational where we invited a lot of different law school programs um, that were similar to this. So these are law schools that were offering curricula um, or, or a four credit class that involved working with the legal aid organization to, to develop a legal tool. And so we had um, 11 or 12 schools compete. Um, school from Hong Kong, Australia, Canada, and we have several schools in the US who all have varying and different kinds of programs that develop um, these sorts of design and technology skills for law students. Uh, I think one thing to take away um, is that you can have a lot of tech classes in your law program, like coding for lawyers. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I took this to heart when I heard um, a justice technology entrepreneur tell me um, she, when she's looking to hire somebody for her tech or legal tech um, firm or, or company, she's not going to hire a lawyer that has had a project experience um, doing this sort of tech work, right? Because you need tech expertise to actually deliver product and, and stuff like that. And so there are a lot more skills than just the technology involved in, in technology for law and for, te uh, for justice, right? You, you have the, the entire consumer cycle of feedback, testing, um, focus group, you know, all of these design principles. And, and that sometimes is extremely important. And, and as a lawyer who has the legal expertise to say, you know, this is where the legal right comes in, legal information versus advice, um, that comes into play, but the lawyer has to kind of be able to navigate what tech systems are going to exist, right? And so there's gonna be a component that has coding, there's gonna be algorithm. And so let's bring in experts that have this, right? And so there's, more of a, a project management role that attorneys um, can take on these sorts of uh, uh, programs. And I don't, I don't think those are skills that law schools are really teaching right now, right? I think the, the whole model of delivering um, a product to a client is a memo or some sort of litigation um, service is not always true, especially in the justice tech space. And so to be an advocate, you need sort of this well-rounded human-centered approach it requires a lot of empathy. And so you need to um, be able to articulate um, the experience and, and turn um, justice services into more consumer oriented, um, I think resources. And, and that is very different from typical law school stuff. So whatever curriculum is gonna develop these sorts of aptitudes, um, I think that's a great way of packaging it in a way that an employer is gonna see as employable. Uh, and I think uh, there are a lot of legal project management roles um, that are kind of 
becoming more popular because they're, they're doing a lot of this systems data, um, looking at data and then trying to figure out efficiencies and, and troubleshoot problems in, in law firm operations. And I think uh, those aren't things that lawyers are technically taught to do. And I think that curriculum might be really important, especially as more lawyers are responsible for technology procurement and technology maintenance. Great. Well, thanks again for answering all of our questions. I, that's the last of them that we have. And I guess we'll kind of pass the mic, so to speak, back to Michael. But thank you both. Thanks. Thank you. So, oh, thank you so much, uh, Samantha and Maud, and to our panelists, Dr. Anna and Eduardo. Uh, this has been a fascinating discussion. I, I wish we had more time. Um, but I really do appreciate you all uh, participating and giving some really thoughtful answers to uh, one of my questions. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, we have a couple minutes. If anybody had any question and was afraid to jump in in the chat or you want to just unmute your mic, we have like two or three minutes if you wanted to ask a quick question. I shared the, the link to the Iron Tech Lawyer site in the chat, um, and that will give you like uh, the schools who competed. Um, so Michael, if you're interested, there are a lot of different programs. We had a couple of participants who had independent projects with a, a law professor, and so there was an advisor, she got credit, and she worked for a self-help center on, on a project. And so I think th those are all kind of examples of iterating that skill set that I think you know, provides this informed justice tech advocate. Yeah, I think those sort of projects are really fascinating. And there are things that law schools kind of operate on the periphery of and, and have a real opportunity to get involved in heavily if they actually pay attention. Uh, so thank you so much, Eduardo, for that research. And sure. we'll make sure to, to link in our video when we have our video all cut and edited, we will make sure that uh, we include those links. But I wanted to thank everyone again. Uh, we have just a couple more minutes till seven. Um, but if we don't have any other questions, uh, then we can conclude the webinar. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks. This was great. I really appreciate the questions. My thanks, pleasure. Doctor. It was great chatting. Um, yeah, nice to meet you, Eduardo. This was yeah, great. Yeah, I, I think. I think there's going to be like a, you know, big movement in, in, in that space, but I think there's like a, a long way before, you know, a lot of these data collectors on the court side have the time to really look, look at it, right? It requires a researcher to come in and say, hey, here's what's going on with the data that you're collecting. Um, I think they're just, folks are so overworked, the dockets are huge, and there's now an extremely long list of things that, um, court staff are going to have to deal with that I, I imagine there's not a lot of room to have these high level conversations, which I think is a shame. And that's, a I think, a part of the conversation that ought to be innovated is just like, how do we embed all of that in these rapid responses? Yeah. And, and uh, at on a sort of a, a sort of broader political level uh, with regard to these issues, especially the intersection of technology and civil rights. I mean, we've seen the last the last three years have been a, a leadership vacuum, right? This was this was something that, that the Obama administration's Office of Science and Technology Policy took really seriously um, and really built up a, a capacity for that evaporated. Um, and, and there wasn't even a director of the center for uh, of the of the OSTP for I think the first two and a half years of the Trump administration, right? So it was it's really Really like a, a space where there was uh, there was a lot of there was a lot of leadership at the federal level to uh, to support research in this area, to support work in this area, to issue recommendations. Um, uh, the Obama administration put out a number of, of influential reports on big data and civil rights, and um, and poof, it, it, was, it was just gone. So uh, I think there's been a, a real vacuum, um, and that companies have tried to fill that in certain ways. Other groups have have tried to step up in certain ways, but. Um, we'll see what the, the future holds uh, in terms of you know, that kind of centralized leadership on this issue. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Have a good one, y'all.